Hello, it's Brad Laurie or Blockchain Brad. And on, on behalf of Block Vera, it's my honor to once again welcome back Richard Yen. He is the COO of VIT, and that's French for fast. Richard, thank you very much for being on the channel once more. Of course. Always good to see you, Brad. Likewise. Now, for those who want to know, in the name of transparency, truth, and trust, this is entirely supported by VIT. Uh, VIT have always been there to support both myself and Block Vera in our endeavor to try and enable uh, more com content creators. So essentially, Block Vera is about trying to support unbiased content. So what we do with some of that support from VIT is really try to contact other sub content creators and allow them a platform so they can go and produce unbiased uh, content as well. So thank you, Richard, for that support. Now, as an update, as I explained, the idea is to really allow you to explain to the people exactly what's been happening with Beat of late. Now, first and foremost, you are fast by design. You're all about trying to facilitate uh, other blockchain systems to enable better outcomes. Can you just give us a quick recap, though, of what Beat stands for? Sure. So as you mentioned, VIT stands for fast in French. So we basically design our chain around performance. And so the way uh, VIT works is that um, the two most important features are fast and free. So let me explain both in turn, right? So in terms of a fast transaction, I'm literally talking about quick transaction throughput. Uh, sorry, uh, high transaction throughput and quick transaction settlement. And the way we uh, do that is through a selection of a DAG ledger, and in particular, Nano's block lattice. And we basically have a consensus algorithm based on delegated proof of stake. Um, and then the second part is free, right? So one big issue with Bitcoin Ethereum, aside from the speed problem, is that transactions cost a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. So the way we approach this problem is not only in having extremely high throughput, therefore reducing the burden of miners in terms of processing transactions, we also have a staking model. So every transaction does not, uh, so it, when you perform a transaction on VIT, you do not need to spend gas. So all you need is some VIT that you stake, and then you can basically get it back. And uh, in fact, right now, the way it works is that you don't even need VIT if you want to send any kind of transaction on our network, you can do a little bit of proof of work. And that proof of work is not to be confused with um, proof of work. With, this is more just a, a throttling or anti-spamming device. And you can literally send a transaction within seconds. But the, right now, our decentralized exchange has launched. So if you want to process many transactions within a short time, then you would need to have VIT because the more VIT you stake, the more quota you obtain for sending transactions. Right. But it's free, meaning after you send the transactions, you can sell the VIT, you're not consuming any gas, and none of your assets is getting smaller and smaller as a result of you sending transactions. Right. So, so, so Rich, so just, to, just to jump in though, given that your transactions are relatively cheap or if not free, as you mentioned, and also the fact that um, through your depot system, essentially you're moving away from that proof of work challenge of very exhaustive energy consumption. Rich, are you also trying to really move on from those first iterations of Bitcoin itself, given that you're moving towards mainnet soon? Clearly you want to be that scaling solution uh, you're also very much geared towards supporting applications. So are you one are you one up in Bitcoin? Yeah, absolutely. Multiple up. X Multiple up. up. Okay, yeah. X up. <laughs> yeah, so the thing is, I think the best proof of how our technology works is the decentralized exchange that was launched at the end of July. And in fact, we just turned on the mining function, but I can get into more detail later. Mm. But the decentralized exchange is a heavy-duty D app built on our platform. So a couple of things, right? Number one, Bitcoin doesn't have a Turing complete script. And no. you can't build smart contract on Bitcoin. And you can build smart contract on Vite. But the decentralized, app, the decentralized exchange being a prime example of that. Second of all, the transactions are super fast. The user experience is very, very similar to that you would see from a centralized exchange. And then lastly, you do not pay fee to the Vite chain. Yes, you do pay transaction fees because you do, sorry, you do pay uh, trading fees because that's how exchanges work, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll get into how that contributes to the mining pool and how miners get their share from the VTEX exchange later. But the point is that um, the, the, the very fast and free chain, the functionalities have been fully proven out in the uh, VTEX uh, 
uh, decentralized exchange. Right, that, that's exciting because we hear a lot about the talk of you know maximalist conversations. We really don't hear enough of the value of scalable solutions to really onboard applications for real use case and for the mainstream to really you know come on board with the blockchain narrative. You're bringing all of that to life, Rich, with what you're doing as part of the V team. Now, Ethereum was arguably the first to really showcase what a smart contract could do but they're quite slow in comparison. So do you want to give us a bit of a contrast so people understand the difference between you and Ethereum with regard to what you can do? Sure. I think it still lies in the free and fast nature of the chain. So Ethereum is neither free nor fast. Ethereum consumes gas, transactions consume gas, and it's not fast because it's low teens of transactions per second, if that, maybe Mm -hmm. less than 10. So... We basically solve both problems with Beat, and we are a smart contract platform. Our programming language is called Solidity++, so it's maximally compatible with Solidity and the uh, Ethereum virtual machine. So uh, if you need to port your program from Solidity to Beat, it's not that difficult. Um, but ultimately, I think the reason why we're, um, uh, we are able, we're able to achieve better performance than Ethereum is exemplified in the free and fast versions. So I think one other way you can think about the difference between us and Ethereum is the DEX being built on V versus DEX being built on Ethereum, right? Just compare us with, say, IDEX, which is the largest decentralized exchange in the world, and that's built on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Every transaction, every order you make, regardless of whether it goes through, just for you to put in a limit order on the order book will cost you gas, right? Because that is a Ethereum transaction, and that is not the case with us. In fact, if you compare us against some other DEXs out there, like Cosmos-based um, Binance DEX, mm-hmm. they have the same problem, right? If you want to make an order, whether or not it goes through, you get charged some gas, and that's not the case with us. Right. So, Rich, the big question is, given that money rules the world still to this day, you know, some would disagree, but obviously it's a key part of you know, business ecosystems. Why don't more people know about V, given that there's a real value uh, prop? with regard to the, the FF? So it's a great question. Um, I feel like I've been asked, trying to answer that question every time I come on your show. Mm. So the truth is that I think um, the market has been proliferating with blockchain projects trying to solve the scalability issue. Now everyone has a different approach. And um, I think this game has sort of become... Um, a contest of PR. So whoever can recruit the best spokesperson can get on the um, headlines of the most influential media page. Mm -hmm. Um, Sort of seems to have the mic and get get others to find out about them. Um, The approach we have always been taking is have our applications talk on our behalf. That's Mm -hmm. why our budget for marketing and other types of things, um, other types of non-R&D things is extremely low. Um, to the chagrin of our chief marketing officer, in <laughs> fact. So, um, you know, the other thing we're trying to do with, uh, in parallel with decentralized exchange is public finance. So some time ago, I did talk to you about what we're doing with the city of Syracuse in America. Did. So public finance in America, other parts of the world, have always had trouble accessing financing. And we thought that why not try to tokenize um, some, say, benefits you can obtain from the government. For example... What we're doing with City of Syracuse is that they have a donation program. If you donate for the benefit of a homeless person or a housing project, you get some token in return. And then you as the donor can now spend this token to redeem products and services for, at participating merchants within the city limits. Right. And basically you're keeping liquidity within the city, you're stimulating local economy, and at the same time providing additional incentive for donation. Right. It's a, bit, it's a bit like those dockets you get when people go shopping on the back of your receipt. You know, really, they're often localized as well. I thought about this because I read into the white paper for the Syria coin, I think it's called, and the way it's explained. So clearly, you are incentivizing those micro economies, those local economies. That's a great thing. But Rich, going back to that question, though, mate, before we talk about Syracuse, why don't people know about the free and the fast nature of this in comparison to the ones that are getting all of the, the attention? Now, you mentioned the PR and branding and, uh, you know, those with the strong, with the powerful mic in their hand, um, mm-hmm. they're, they're grandstanding sometimes. 
what, but why isn't the free and the, the fast speaking louder? Because it saves money. Um, it's a great question. I think it comes down to, so we haven't been spending huge dollars at, say, conferences or, mm -hmm. you know, PR firms to help pitch us to Coindesk or, say, Cointelegraph or Wall Street Journal. I see. Uh, and in fact, I do see it as sort of unfair because I definitely know about projects where it's all about, um, say, community development or mm. economic And so, um, and, and they spend a huge amount of money there to get the attention, but ultimately deliver um, not so much in the use of the Right. Well, Rich, don't worry, honestly, because this is early days and if they're going to spend all their resources on branding, then essentially, you know, grad over time, we'll start to see a shift where those with the, integ the, the integrity, uh, the, the, the quality underpinning them with real value, they will come up trumps. They'll, they're the ones that will come up and really start to surpass those that are just built on crypto crap. So, you know, your agenda is really tech-centric right from the outset. And then yeah. gradually people, I think, will come on board as the tech speaks for itself. Is that fair to say? So that's fair to say. And I also want to be a little bit more specific because many other projects might say the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's our deck. The decentralized exchange and mining's open. So there are five different ways you can mine the VX coins and subsequently share in the dividend of the exchange proceeds. Mm -hmm. So you can trade the mine, you can list the coin to mine, you can refer others to mine, you can, um, you can stake VEAT for the benefit of the DEXMAR contract to mine. And um, uh, lastly, you can make an order, even if the order doesn't go through. So as long as you put an order book on the, on the if you, as long as you put an order on the order book for sufficiently long, you also mm -hmm. get to mine. Basically, you can mine the VX coin on the exchange. We think it's very attractive. There's no ICO. There's no pre-mining. And um, there's no private sale. All the coins are mineable by anybody, um, you know, from the very beginning. And it's mineable right now at this very moment. I see. So, Rich, in that context, I really want to talk about um, the value of the non-pre-mine or no pre-mine, comparing that to BTC, for example, because many people talk about the value of BTC being that open source distributed um, mineable asset right from the outset. How, what's the similarities there given that very few have that no pre-mine start? So in that way, Bitcoin and VEX are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, they, they both subscribe to the decentralization ethos. We basically give the uh, privilege to the entire world to enjoy this asset as long as you participate in this ecosystem, then you get to obtain this currency. Mm -hmm. Now, with one caveat, right? So in this case, we're a little bit more like Zcash. So there is a, um, uh, a, developer, a developer fund contribution. So with every 10 VX that get mined, one VX gets sent to the developer fund mm -hmm. to help continue to maintain this. And right. we think this is fair because someone still has to keep the lights on at the exchange and fix bugs and answer customer questions. Mm -hmm. So it's an automatic contribution that's set up through design. But I want to talk to you about the distribution model as well because many people suggest um, that Bitcoin had a very fair distribution approach from the outset. But then there are others who rightly argue that there are block, uh, Bitcoin billionaires out there because they were quite advant uh, advantaged by early access. So yes, it was no pre-mine, no pre but they could mine a substantial amount very early on when there was a very small uh, group of people who were aware of it at the time. They were, you know, the cypherpunks and, and the libertarians, they engaged quite a bit and, and obviously it followed suit in that respect. So how are you trying to, uh, I guess, one-up that scenario where it's even more distributed and it's fairer by design from the outset? Yeah, so... Um First of all, I think it's impossible to try to reach everybody at the beginning. Mm -hmm. This information that just is public and, you know, I think in general there's fair access, there's no password, there's no, you know, the website hidden behind some firewall, right? And um, so I think it's impossible to reach everyone. And the second thing is that about Bitcoin billionaires and so forth, mm -hmm. I mean, I personally got to know about Bitcoin in, I think, 2009 or 2010. Someone showed me the white paper. I read it, didn't think much of it. And I imagine many, many other people are like that. And at the time, I think Bitcoin was less than $50. So mm -hmm. a coin, right? And I imagine many others were afforded the opportunity, decided not to take it on. Mm -hmm. So I think the Bitcoin billionaires 
basically had the belief they were huddlers and you know good for them so i don't think that they got there because of unfair information advantage i think even though not everybody knew about it many many people knew about it some people decided to mine or purchase some people decided not to so i basically think that it's going to be the same for vx we aren't going to serve ads so that everyone in the world will see it and it's entirely possible someone will see this when say the vx coin is 50 cents and think nothing of it and then think nothing of it when it's two dollars i think nothing of it when it's five dollars and so forth mm. that's okay i think as long as our approach is not we're not intentionally trying to get only a part of the world to know this information then we've done our job I see. Now, in, with respect to currency, obviously there are core aspects to a, a successful and thriving currency. One of them is the store of value, but you also have a unit of account and a medium of exchange as well embedded in that. Um, many people are talking about that, that primary function of BTC of store of value. Are you trying to move beyond that to ensure that medium of, ex medium of exchange is paramount when we talk about the, the, the VTX exchange token? You know, because surely you want trade to be valid. You want to make sure that this ecosystem is robust rather than just have that huddle philosophy. Yeah. So the idea here is that we want our exchange to be the place where people want to trade on a decentralized basis. That's actually our end goal, right? So VX is only a bridge to the new world. So let's talk VTEX for a second. Okay. Right now we have... 11 different coins on there, but with more trading pairs. But the different coins are all selected based on exclusivity, meaning these are altcoins that are deemed by our team to be um, good coins with good community, but somehow didn't find their way onto larger exchange platforms. Mm -hmm. And this is where we have an advantage. We can basically get people that want to trade these coins to come to us. And so I mentioned that we are a decentralized platform. That's also key, right? So there was a huge theft at, uh, you know, from all the way to Mt. Gox to Binance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Binance mm -hmm. X, there's criticism about whether it's truly decentralized. The bottom line is that as long as regulations do not catch up, centralized exchanges have a way of misappropriating user funds or being hacked or, you know, or being hacked. Who knows whether they're being hacked externally? Right. Or there's no proof. There's no way to find out. So... Basically, the ultimate goal is to be the decentralized exchange where people can find all kinds of coins, right? Now, VX, on the other hand, is only a bridge, meaning VX is what's generating the buzz right now because of a few reasons. Number one is that it's a mineable coin, right? So like I said, you don't have to purchase it, just make transactions, you can get it. There's no pre-mining, so there's no cell wall. And then the other reason is that with VX, you can... Um, receive dividends right so you basically share in the proceeds of the exchange but one other very important point to consider is that um uh so when you trade on when you trade on vtex um the, the idea is that we're trying to grow the trading pair on there right now there's only um like i said 10 or 11 altcoins and when people come to our exchange they might get the the, um, they might get this understanding that there's not enough depth or not enough coins to choose from, so why mm -hmm. bother? But the truth is that we're trying to add coins as we go, and we're not trying to add a lot of ERC-20s because there's not a whole lot of competition for us, because ERC-20 can be added very easily by anybody, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're adding right now are mainnet coins, and that requires reading their docs, keeping up with their forks and upgrades. And um, right now, I, I think we're probably, it's going to be less than three coins mm -hmm. per week. Um, with our engineering team it, because it is truly a lot of work. I, see. Um, but I think, you know, over time we'll be able to accumulate a portfolio of very interesting coins that people can look at. Right. And also with regard to other exchanges, Richard, many of them do also have a fee um, with regard to the onboarding of those tokens on the ecosystem. Some of them are doing due diligence or they claim to be. Some are, it seems to be just listing everything that they possibly can. What's the process? You know, you mentioned that you do your own due diligence and that they will, in some, in some respects, sort of, um, you know, not acknowledged by some of the more uh, reputable or, or really well-known exchanges. So what, how do you decide as a team what is worthy of being uh, onboarded onto on onto your exchange onto the decks yeah so actually i need to clarify a point so the way our decentralized exchange operates is that we have a concept called exchange operators mm -hmm. and this one is actually open 
So that means if you want to become, if you want to list coins, you like personally or your company, for example, you would apply to become an operator. And once you get approved, then you can list as many coins and whatever coins you want. Now, so when, when I talk about these, uh, the coin listing process, I'm referring to the coin listing process by our gateways. We currently have one, two, three, four, five gateways on there. And then there's the VLabs official gateway that only lists mainstream coins. So that's BTC, um, uh, ETH, and a few others. Mm -hmm. And then there's another gateway called VGate. And VGate basically lists many altcoins according to the philosophy that I previously told you about. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one called Excess Coin. I think they recently listed Loopring. Um, and there's like two other ones. So ultimately, we're actually opening this up to the community. And um, as long as you're approved, you can run an operator and then list coins that way. And then in terms of listing fees, in terms of how you want to uh, set the transaction fees for your trading zone, so to speak, that's all up to you as the operator. Right. So, Rich, how does this affect VEAT? We go back to the VEAT token, for example, and focus on your own beginning ecosystem or central ecosystem for the whole network. Um, how is this DEX and its token going to facilitate the uptake of everything else? Yeah, so there are a few scenarios where VEAT is involved. Number one is when trading on this exchange, in order to secure a large enough quota, you need to stake VEAT. That's mm -hmm. the whole economic, that's the whole transaction model of the VEAT framework, right? And because VTX is built on top of VEAT, naturally any transaction you, build, you do there, you need to stake VEAT if you want to trade at a sufficiently large um, TPS. Right. And the second way I think Vita is involved is just that this is a Vtex is a product built by Vita, so you know um, we're the ob observing others paying attention to Vita as a result of their trading experience on Vtex. Mm -hmm. They might be interested in the team, they might be interested in the technology of Vita, and um, in fact, Vita has other products too, right? So they look at our wallet, they look at our store, and um, they're all high. built. Yes. We pay, well, VPay is the payment module within our store, which is called mm -hmm. a VEAT store. Right. So, so then people can uh, subsequently discover other VEAT products as a result of using the uh, exchange. It's kind I of see. Like a spillover. So, Rich, in that sense, what's your, your vision for the next, say, three to six months for VTEX? Given that you mentioned there's different ways, there's different vehicles for um, coins to be listed on your DEX. Do you see it really growing quickly? Yeah, so there are a couple of things we're um, focusing on. Number one is the recruiting of more operators because the more operators we have, the more ways we have in terms of reaching various communities. And, you know, then it alleviates any kind of operating burden or I guess it just scales the amount of operation that you can be doing, right, with mm. these operating partners. And then the other focus we have is um, continuing to improve the user experience on VTEX from a technological standpoint, user interface standpoint. And lastly, um, we're now, we, the mining is very important of VX, right? So that process has been going on for about a week now. Mm -hmm. And um, right now, the uh, VX being released is actually still very small. So there's no major mining going on because um, that's the way we currently have it set up. And we're now um, contemplating uh, by the time the interview is released, this might hardly been done. But we're releasing a few votes to the community about the new uh, VX release schedule that would most benefit, benefit the ecosystem. So um, this is sort of a mathematical and game theory sort of problem mm -hmm. because the, if you release a lot versus you release a little, if you release a lot now and a little later or mm -hmm. very little now or a lot later, or any combination of those over time, you're, you can get very, very different results in terms of people's participation and interest level. I see. So we're in options right now. We're so it's still, it's still quite experimental. You haven't even worked out exactly how that the token economic model will sort of, it's not finite, it's what you're saying. Well, the release um, schedule was, we had a draft for it and then we decided to go with it. And then mm -hmm. um, after we released the schedule, we realized that um, from based on community feedback and the amount of participation, we just realized that the reality did not match our expectations. So then we had to make some adjustments to it. Right. Well, kudos to you and your team for listening to the community because that's quite rare, Richard. Now, what do you, what, can you talk us through the, the performance of the token of, of, of VTEX for a moment so we can understand you know, how that's 
really evolved and whether that's been you know adopted by the community and supported and that'll be reflected obviously in the price and then well, later on we can talk about v separately okay so the price of vx that whole history has only been in existence for a week because this is how long the mining has happened because zero vx literally existed before mining started right that's the right. point and so vx went up to um, a significant amount i believe north of two us dollars um Okay, that's a lot. Very soon after it came about. And then um, because more VX has been mined now, right, the price uh, and there's more supply and the price naturally has dropped. It's now about 70 cents. Um, but because we will be um, making changes to the release schedule based on community input, I imagine that the price of VX will also uh, oscillate as a result of that. Um, you can think of VX as sort of a, I mean, some people might interpret it as a confidence uh, indicator for mm -hmm. the exchange. Um, but ultimately, I think the most important thing is um, still you have to you have to take into consideration the price of VX together with the um, the release schedule of VX. Um, it's it's not as the price itself is not as simple, even though I think a lot of people will just see it that way. Right, okay, and obviously in the future as more of the token economic model uh, un unfolds, more information unfolds based on community feedback, we'll come to know, um, you know, the crux of this token and how it, how, how it fundamentally operates for the long term. And also because we don't yet know exactly what the, the supply is, you know, it's still all up in the air, isn't it, with how, what's, what's to come with the design? No, 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 the supply has been fixed. So okay. it's a total supply. Um, and in fact, we already released a Medium article with all of that. It's just the release schedule, right? Right. So, um, we were thinking about a 477,000 um, to be released on the first day and then gradually come down. Mm -hmm. um, not exponentially, but, um, but a gradual decrease. Um, but then what we decided to do is we, we decided to release a constant amount of only 10,000 a day for an indefinite period before we get to that spiky uh, large supply right and I think that's good that you're trialing these different things because essentially it's just how you release so everything else is already set and published so my apologies if I didn't make that clear before um, but if we now move across to the your core token Richard for a moment because one of the things that we're seeing in the whole space is a very sincere lack of um, proof when it comes to sound token economics that underpins the ecosystems that are purported to have value um, VEAT, you've always made it clear as a utility token by fundamental design, it drives everything. But I had a look at the performance of the token, Rich, since you started. And, no. you know, I think it's a fair statement to say it hasn't really, um, a, you know, if, if we you know, just look at it on raw value, it hasn't seemed to correlate with all the things you've been doing. So we really need to try and talk about this so that we can get some more confidence back in, from the communities out there and also for the VEAT community to understand the correlation, the token velocity and everything in, for the long term. Yeah, so I can't predict the future of the coin price, but if you were to look at the performance of altcoins since the, say, boom of Bitcoin in May of this year, mm -hmm. everything is right? Even Ethereum has not been keeping up with the um, performance of Bitcoin. That's true. I think this is just generally a perhaps market coming to consensus that Bitcoin is digital gold and it is a storage of value. The fact that it can transacts very slowly doesn't really bother people. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, well, if I need to transact a piece of gold bar, right, me and you, it's going to take, you know, weeks, but the piece of gold bar is still a storage of, a store of value. So I think that's what this kind of statement the market is making right now. As far as when this market might turn around um, with regard to altcoins, I can't really say for sure. Um, the truth is that we have been just focusing on our development and we really have pushed out products that you can feel, touch, taste, use, and you know, we're hoping that the coin price will at some point reflect that. Wow. But the other thing, I, I think the other thing to take note of is also just the, um, the amount of trading too, right? If there's not much 
there's not a lot of trading happening. That also just means there's. Um, I, I think that just means that it's in a it, it's is in a state where uh, few people want to purchase, but also few people want to sell, right? So the ones that are holding on to it have not um, completely lost interest or have not completely felt that this is a worthless item. Right. Either. But Rich, you mentioned, you know, that people want to believe in the, the SOV narrative and essentially, you know, the philosophy there is HODL. But when we're talking about your ecosystem, it's driven by utility. Now, that's the nature of your token and, and thus the incentive is to use, you know, it's the to, to interact. It's very different to the way in which people treat Bitcoin. So what's being done to really to ensure that the growth of the ecosystem um, uh, correlates with the utility model so that when the more usership um, that comes from the ecosystem, the greater uh, the value of that token, arguably, because of this, the, the magnitude. Yeah, so we just think that decentralized exchange is the future because a decentralized trading process is transparent and it is, um, uh, it, it is just a better practice than centralized exchange. Right now, mm. people are trading, so, and, and previously, people were trading convenience for. Uh, security, meaning they're okay with keeping their money on various centralized exchanges. Mm. Now the convenience part is gone because um, because Dex Vtex is now on mobile. It's on iOS and Android. It's on uh, sorry, it's only on iOS at the moment, but it will be on Android later. But it's on um, you know your laptop, and the performance is extremely high. Um, so we really think that in terms of user experience, we now match or have exceeded uh, centralized exchanges. Mm -hmm. We're just waiting for a sea change where people decide to ditch centralized exchanges for decentralized exchanges. Right. right. And obviously, because you have your own DEX, the reliance yeah. on totally. the success of VTEX is also significant for VT itself. Right. For whatever reason, the, the users have, not, have decided not to ditch Binance for the amount of coins that they have lost, mm. uh, the coins that Right, they just decided not to move their money away from it. Mm. So, but, but why, Rich? That's what I want to know from you know your point of view as a COO. Is if you know there's evidence empirically that there is centralized elements, if you know that there throughout some of these uh, centralized exchanges that there is wash trading going on or bots put in, you know there's problems with a lot of them. Um, why aren't people migrating to a better bet on, on with DEXs? So a couple of things. Number one is maybe the hack is not fatal, right? It's not sufficiently large to deal a blow to the system. Second reason is also just a, um, actually the, uh, uh, num so, so the other reason is that even though in terms of trading experience, our DEX, I think matches or exceeds centralized exchanges, the truth is we don't have enough coins on there yet. Mm -hmm. So if you want to buy you know, you have a large appetite, you come on our website, you only see 11 coins, and then the, the depth is not high, then, mm -hmm. you know, right, you might still not be interested. So right now, we're basically trying to attract people with VX, and our, um, and our various operators are trying to keep up in terms of listing new altcoins that people will be interested in. Right. Well, you know, it's exciting to see this build out. Um, and I'm obviously by the end of the year, Rich, you'll have a lot more. Um, but if we can move now to some of the, you mentioned some of those products and we've discussed some of them, things like your multi-token wallet. You also, you have your marketplace as well with VPay, a key aspect of that. Um, Vite Labs, can we talk a little bit more about that to just get an update on that for those who perhaps haven't heard of it or, you know, want an update themselves? Oh, VLabs is actually just the name of the project. So Vite is the public blockchain, and then VLabs is the entity that's making it. So it has no connotations like Binance Labs or okay. VLabs. So with regard, with regard to the team then, if that's all just, you know, in one sense, the same thing, how is the team going to drive Vite and Vite Labs? Have you expanded the team or is it staying, stayed the same? Because you've always said it's about the quality of the team, not the quantity. Yeah, so we actually have quite a few people now. We have 35 in Beijing and we have five out here in Silicon Valley, but that's not including, you know, the, all the community managers we have. We have community manager for almost all major language groups now, even including um, Bengali, right, mm -hmm. and um, uh, Arabic and, you know, Spanish and Italian. So, yeah, we're not, inc if, if, we're, if we're counting those 
guys as well, then we're expanding rapidly. We have um, received help from some translators on things, and we've also had contractors that build out uh, or other external teams that build out other key apps on our wallets. Right. Well, there's a lot happening there. And I, I noticed also you're doing some referral campaigns and perhaps some other PR stuff as well. Can you just give us a rundown on those referral campaigns, even with regard to VX with the, the referral mining um, campaigns that you're doing there as well? Right. So referring is mining basically means it, you can, as, as a trader, you can generate a, a code on your VTEX account mm -hmm. and you can give it to your friend or someone else and that person will enjoy lower trading fees and then you would also be entitled to receiving some benefit in the form of um, uh, trading fee profit. I see. So the more that people you're connected with that um, onboard onto the mining system, you benefit from that if you use the referral. That's correct. Okay, or if they use the referral. Now, Rich, I want to ask you about mainnet coming up. That's a big deal. Um, there's been a lot of information about the pre-mainnet buzz, but how far away uh, are we from mainnet? It's this month. So it's going to be between the 20th and the 30th of this month in September. And okay. So that, that would, would have fulfilled, I would say, 95% of what we set out to do in the white paper. So wow. You well, can you just give us a bit of a rundown for those who don't know what that actually means? Yeah, so the white paper basically outlined a block lattice-based ledger system that also supports smart contract. So everything I just said in that sentence will be done by the... To be honest with you, everything I just said has already been done, but there will be a few bells and whistles to be added for the mainnet release. Mm -hmm. We talked about a decentralized exchange in our white paper. That's already been done. Um, we talked about... Um, we talked about, let's see, there were a few, um, I, the only items that uh, we did say that would be interesting to implement have not, that are in the plans to be done are uh, things like contract scheduling or um, contract upgrade or... Um, and even your scalability, I mean, that's consistently improving as well. Some other other uh, smaller items, but that will still be worked on. But mm. when you talk about availability, like you know, our whole tagline was a generalized platform for um, uh, that's truly scalable and decentralized. Right. And it's exactly what we already have now. So the white right. paper would deliver on our promise to make this, and you know, and theoretically that that would just mark as a major major milestone for what we have set out to do a year ago. Well, you're certainly on track, Richard, you and your team. You don't muck around. You know, you really do mean business when you try and stick to everything you plan. So congratulations so far. With regard to the pipeline, um, applications, for example, or interactions with uh, partners of today and tomorrow, can you give us some indicators of the onboarding factor? You know, what's, how, how this is being built out since you are genuinely on track to make sure that you're engaging with more than just Syracuse and the success you've had there. Yeah, so the two main tracks we have right now, one is decentralized exchange partners. So those would be the operators that I previously talked about. These mm -hmm. operators can list any coins of their choice. They can set transaction fees. And then the second, um, second uh, track is public finance. So this is city of Syracuse. We started the conversation with city of San Jose. Mm -hmm. We have submitted applications to the city of, uh, the st we've talked to state of Rhode Island, uh, city of Berkeley, United Nations, UNICEF, um, let's see, uh, many others. So like South African, we have an African business development manager. So we're talking to SARB, South African Reserve Bank. Uh, we're talking to WAMI, West African Monetary Institute. Mm -hmm. And um, we're talking to Seychelles Stock Exchange. They want to tokenize things. So, so I also noticed you're talking to Nigeria as well. So it was interesting how there's a strong sort of focus in Africa. Is there any particular reason why, you know, you really want to go there in that region? Yeah, it's just that uh, parts of the world with lacking infrastructure, they tend to be more open to new things. Mm -hmm. so if you think of the way China has exceeded America and many Western worlds in terms of its 5G network, it's because it had nothing to start with. The mm -hmm. fact that China chat now, no one carries wallets or paper fiat around. They use their phones to pay for stuff. is because they had bad infrastructure to start with, right? It's like when you have 
it's like that line, why go out for steak when you have pizza at home? Well, <laughs> the problem is when you have pizza at home, you got to go look for something else better, right? Chances are you, st- you know, you, you, chances are you come across a uh, piece of steak. The problem is right. that when you got pizza at home, you're incentivized to try new things and that's how you lag behind. So that, that we think Africa is a very promising area precisely because many, many very, very basic things are not there yet. Right. So do you, do you envision that you'll capitalize more in that region and expand the reach of VEAT throughout the continent and then obviously look at other regions like, for example, some parts of Asia that haven't been touched or perhaps South America and Central America? Right. So right now we're focusing one thing at a time. In Africa, our business development manager, Emmanuel, lives in Ghana and Mm -hmm. then he's going to uh, attend a major conference in Nigeria and he has basically set up meetings with very high profile people from politicians to merchants in the area. Um, And I think someone else from the V team will also be joining him and uh, we're hoping to have very, very fruitful conversations. And of course, all these have very long uh, business development cycles, however, right? From the moment you engage their interest all the way to implementing a, all the way to, let's say, signing of any contract to implement some kind of solution that will take time. But I think we're doing the right things, moving in the right direction. I see. And, and Richard, on that note, are you confident that the, the functionality of the utility is there, that the provability in utility is there, um, as opposed to some suggesting that, you know, many of these things don't have provability, they don't have real evidence of use case. Are you confident that V does have that? And so, it's strengthening. I think so. So I think a lot of the criticism for blockchain use case right now is, um, say, lack of decentralization or lack of true decentralization, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I would argue that from a purist perspective, indeed, many blockchain projects are unable to deliver 100% decentralization, uh, us included, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But if you have decentralization as a spectrum and you try to eliminate as much centralization as possible, and get as close to the utopian state as possible, then we are definitely one of the champions. So, right. yeah, to your question, are we going to bring about utility? Absolutely. Right, well, congratulations for continuing that endeavor. Now, Richard, with regard to some of the network stoppages that you've had, a few hiccups have happened. You've been very transparent as a team about it. Do you want to talk to us a bit about those issues so that you know we can see how you address them? Oh, sure. Um, so, to be honest with you, we certainly... Um, take these matters very seriously and we're trying to minimize as much, many hiccups as possible. Mm-hmm. These things happen. So every time this does take place, we examine the causes and try to patch the holes and try to move on. So um, I think with the mainnet release, things will be relatively stable from that point forward. Right, okay. So how, can you give us some reasons why you know, that will be the case? What, what's the, what, how do we have confidence that what you're doing in mainnet will you know, relieve those problems or, or alleviate those hiccups? Oh, I think it's certainly, okay. Well, a um, couple of things. Number one is just a matter of time. I think the reason why people consider Bitcoin as relatively secure is because it's been 10 years in the running and no major uh-huh. loophole has been discovered, right? So with us, we haven't been around for a very long time, but with every um, passing second with us being live, um, we basically prove out our usefulness. Mm-hmm. Um, and sorry, I mean, prove out the, the security. Um, and then the other thing is that um, in preparation for the launch of the mainnet, we have actually engaged a um, security com- external security company. Um, they performed a penetration, um, penetration attack audit on our systems. And they have basically pointed out various areas for improvement which is actually not a lot and we've been able to address them right well it's good that you're doing that especially coming from an outside um, party and auditor um, what about the slogan tokenizing america i think that was interesting that you, we could read about that you started with syracuse as as you mentioned and that's planned out for others are you planning on going a lot further than that uh based on the empirical evidence that it's been a success i tweeted the american presidential um Democratic presidential candidate, uh, Andrew Yang, last night. He's the guy that wanted to do UBI, universal basic income, $1,000 per month per person mm-hmm. in America, questions asked. I basically proposed a, with the tweet that, why, that, that we can tokenize it so we can restrict usage. So we don't want people to buy illegal drugs with it. We don't want people to use it for um, bad purposes. Um, 
Number one. Number two is we can track consumer behavior. If you're giving people cash in the form of a check, mm. why not have digital currency, right? Um, and then lastly, um, the transaction cost is just a lot lower if you were to do everything on the blockchain, right? right. So, yeah, we'll see how he responds. Well, imagine, yes, if he, uh, imagine if he does respond, Richard. That could be a really big deal, quite literally. <laughs> could be, yeah. So, but in general, the idea that we, the, you know, we already have the uh, Seracoin app in test mode. I can show you just very quickly on the interface here. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And how have you found the feedback, Richard, as you're pitching this to other regions? I imagine you are all the time. Clearly, you, you know, the success of Syracuse is a great asset for Veet to showcase this to multiple regions, not just of, uh, in throughout the US, but throughout the world. I mean, having a redeemable system that's enclosed and for a, a, you know, a, a precinct that's designed to help and bolster their economy, that's a really powerful tool to have. Yeah, um, I, I would say that um, because this, so everyone's interested. Everyone's very interested. In general, the public sector tends to be slow moving vehicles. Mm -hmm. So even working with the current, um, current patron has been, has been proven somewhat challenging. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the way we see it is that as soon as we have one use case deployed, right, and in public, in public, we'll have um, lots of others following suit. Yeah, so that makes sense. So when do you expect to have more uh, demonstrations from Syracuse in it that it is really, had, has, has moved past integration and then more into proof of success? Yeah. Um, with them, to be honest with you, it's, it's hard to tell. But mm -hmm. let's say we were to pick um, a single government entity, maybe something in 2020, Probably okay. this year. Right. Maybe well, perhaps, perhaps with regard to seeing the app, maybe we could see, get a link to, to that, Richard, rather than demonstrate if you don't have time now. Um, sure. Oh, you're going to show it. Oh, okay. Yes, oh, yeah, I see. It's a bit hard for us to see on the screen. you want to try and change the angle slightly? I oh, see. I yep, we can see it now. Yep. Oh, can make right. a purchase. Um, and then when they try to claim an offer, mm -hmm. right? Basically, this is one Sarah coin you can spend in order to claim that discount offer. Okay. And if you're the if you're the donor, right? So this is the page where you can donate. Mm -hmm. um, this is basically a balance, right? Right now, it's not showing anything, but this this would be your balance. So for every uh, certain amount of fiat that you donate, you get a commensurate amount of Sarah coin back. Right. Okay. So once again, it's a bit like a uh, you know a reden uh, an it's a reward system. Yeah, so this is the merchant page. So mm -hmm. uh, this merchant is called Evergreen, and um, this is their transaction history and their balance and so forth. Right. Okay, so it looks like a reasonably easy interface to use as well with the app. Um, now, I want to talk to you about something that's a little bit challenging, that is the token economic model of VEAT. Have you done anything to tweak that, Richard, since we spoke last? Because I, I always ask about that more and more now, actually, than ever because of the performance of almost all of the so-called altcoins or um, other startups. You know, we see a trajectory that's been generally downhill for the most part. You've been sort of pretty relatively strong and you're moving up a little bit now. But have you been doing anything that's integral to your modeling to really support the future? Or have you just kept it the same? In terms of the economic model for Veet, to be honest mm. with you, not much. Well, we haven't done, been doing any kind of tweet. The mm -hmm. tweak. I think that the um, reason why the altcoin market has not been very strong is because I think the market is right now making a strong statement on Bitcoin being the store of value and not mm -hmm. assigning a lot of value to the other functionalities the other altcoins uh, bring. So, um, but this could change, right? Um, but this. But that change wouldn't, but but that change wouldn't have anything to do with how we change our economic model. Um, I personally feel that what we're trying to do right now is to prove out the use case in decentralized exchange and the mm. finance, and that's what we'll be focusing on. Right. So, do you see the two economic models working in sync, though? Because it seems, as you mentioned before, there's been some strong initial interest and success in the in the token that is VX as well. Um, but again, just to really understand the differences and 
you know, those who want to speculate, they can obviously, but those who want to really support Veet a lot for the long term, what's your advice when they're trying to pick and choose between the exchange coin and the ecosystem coin? Oh, I see. Um, if you're going to make a decision between VX and Veet, oh, that's a hard one. The it's a hard is, one, yeah. Well, the thing is that with VX, um, you can you will share in the proceeds from the exchange, and VX itself also has a price. It's relatively high at the moment. Mm. So I would say if you are... Um, so as a profit seeker, there's probably short-term... Um, you know, benefits to be earned if you were to play in VX. the VX. Yes, that's what I was thinking. And then obviously the long-term play is essentially that, you know, the ecosystem growth over a very long period of time for what is VEAT. So it's just interesting now that you do have these, these two tokens on offer for different use cases, Richard. Now marketing, that's going to be fundamental throughout the process, especially now that you have more assets to bring more products. What, what can you tell us a bit more about the PR pipeline? What's happening there? just to make sure that people are more informed as you build. You, know, you mentioned before about the node operators, um, but what's happening beyond that? Yeah, well, I was hoping uh, talking to you would solve all my problems. <laughs> Sorry, I'm too boring. <laughs> I mean, so like in terms of marketing, I think one major benefit is just that the VX mining has now opened, right? So people can trade on the exchange, list coins on the exchange, market make on the exchange, do referrals on the exchange or stake for the exchange and ultimately get coins mm -hmm. um, that will bring them future exchange proceeds, right? So I think this in, the, in and of itself is a major benefit and, um, you know, hopefully this will catch on. Right. And obviously we always appreciate just the, the transparency and the directness, the candid approach you have. Honestly, it's, we need more of that and you've never been one to play the, the, the shill game and the FOMO game. Um, now, with regard to crypto itself, Richard, right now, we, we, there's no questioning that some of the conduct is questionable in the ecosystem. What does it take, Richard, to have a cleaner crypto? Uh, do we need, you know, holistic reform? Do we need to see a more compliant crypto um, system whereby regulation is just a given? It's a good question. I think there's argument to be made on both sides, and um, maybe they're not mutually exclusive. There's mm -hmm. argument made about how certain countries are too stringent on crypto, right? And then there's certain arguments about how certain wrongdoers in the space aren't being punished. So, right. Uh, I, I think both, neither is mutually exclusive. I think the regulators basically need to better define what it means to be a good player in the space and then regulate as such. But mm -hmm. I'm no lawyer. I can't speak to the very exact legal terms just but do you want to see this space cleaned up you know some of the questionable conduct some of the wash trading some of the dodgy stuff that is definitely happening do you you're obviously a proponent of trying to improve the quality as opposed to you know the quantity that we see now sure sure i think that would be good for everyone in the long run there's mm -hmm. also regulation going on too i think the um you know uh so when the tide goes out, you know who's been swimming naked. The market also right. is changing. Yes, but and are you confident, Rich, that you're not part of the, the, the naked crowd? You know, you're not part of those who've you know, had any questionable sort of nefarious you know, actors within the ecosystem so that you might be you know, subsumed in that group? I think we're good. You're good. Okay, well, I'm good if you're good. Now, what about liquidity? I want to talk to you about that. It looks like OKX is doing going gangbusters for you, certainly doing their job to support you. Um, liquidity is king in many instances when it comes to the success of, of startups. Uh, are you aware of any um, interest, interested parties when it comes to exchanges to support more of your liquidity you know, needs? Um, yes. To be honest with you, we've, we've been approached by a number of exchanges, but um, they all come with exorbitant um, yes. fees. Ridiculous phase. Right. So, and the truth is that we are launching, we have our own decentralized exchange. So, you know, it's sort of a competing product in a sense. Mm. But that's, that's not really the right answer. The right answer is just this, they're too expensive, right? If mm. it's three listings everywhere, we totally get on, right? They're too expensive. 
Well, Rich, I appreciate your transparency there because at the end of the day, it's fortunate um, through your own due diligence and your teams, you've built your own decks. You're not reliant on other um, exchanges to, you know, really achieve more of the liquidity because you're going to create it from within. So I wish you all the very best, mate. And obviously, I would like to see more of that liquidity improve, but in a very legitimate way. And I did have a look and it looked really clean. I mean, obviously, I can't be sure, but seeing that OKX is really supporting you in this way, their reputation is quite strong in this space. Are you confident that the reputation of VEAT is aligning with the way in which liquidity is playing out for you right now? I think so, yeah. Great. Well, Rich, is there anything you wanted to say as a final note? Perhaps I've missed something just as, you know, because obviously this is geared for an update for you to allow all of those who want to know more about VEAT or perhaps are supporters of VEAT right now so they get a true encapsulate of everything that you're doing. So Veet is a free and fast blockchain with a smart contract platform. If you want to create sophisticated DeFi applications with a free and fast transaction infrastructure, then you should look to Veet. Right now, the two main use cases are decentralized exchange and public finance. With decentralized exchange, you can currently mine VX by trading on the exchange, so definitely pay attention to it. It's, v it's a vtex.net. With public finance, we are piloting with the city of Syracuse and look out for more collaborations with other cities and states and unions around the world. Absolutely. So public finance, uh, all about fast, very important part because obviously that's what VEAT stand, stands for. Super important and then free, a big buzzword right now. And most importantly, you know, your success with VX as well with that DEX. Congratulations on all the things you've been doing. You certainly are one that's always been very serious, a bit like me. Um, you want to get things done. You move, you move with your team and that is, and you don't muck around. You're always in fifth gear. So Richard, thank you very much for this update. And I wish you all the very best as you continue to really bring blockchain to the fore and really showcase what it can actually do to change narratives, to change the uh, financial game as well and really allow us to see the benefits as we see things like Syracuse emerge with real success. Thank you, Brad. Take care. You're welcome, mate. Take care.